right, Steve Jones here will call to order at 713 this special joint meeting of the Town Council and Planning and Zoning Commission. Thank you everyone for your patience, the technical difficulties. Uh, if you are a member of the Planning and Zoning Commission, can you raise your hand or unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the public? And then we're going to go around the table. All right, good. Yes. A member of the PDC, Aaron Stevens, member of the PDC. And then we have Colin Udicek, the Town Council, Amy Powell from the Planning and Zoning Commission, Steve Jones, Town Council. John Regan, Town Council, Stanley Khan, Town Council, David Corcoran, Planning and Development, Town Manager Brian Foley, Finance Director Lisa Hancock. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to item two, which is discussion of potential creation of a, an affordable housing trust. We last met as a joint group on the 31st of March, and we had a brief update on the 12th of July, where we set to have a follow-up joint meeting. So David Corcoran has prepared a very thorough update for us and everything that's happened in the past few months and can we for all right yeah absolutely thank thank you mr chair uh, so we uh so the planning and zoning commission has been working and uh, implementing the poc so the 2019 plan of conservation and development called for uh, an enhancement in in our approach to affordable housing uh, in part to comply with uh uh, sort of the state embedded towards uh, having more affordable housing in part because uh, uh, that's what came out of the, the public process through the, the development of the plan of conservation and development. So uh, we, or the Planning and Zoning Commission prepared uh, a whole bunch of uh, different things that ultimately lead uh, partially to the establishment of an affordable housing trust fund. But, but just to quickly discuss some of the things uh, that the commission has been working on in addition to that. Um, so coming up here on September 12th, the next Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, uh, the town or, or the commission is going to uh, uh, have a public hearing on some draft regulations to allow for two-family housing by uh, by zoning permit on lots of over two acres. Right now, uh, the, the current process requires a, a special permit on uh, uh, lots of at least three acres uh, or even up to five acres. So this is a fairly substantial change uh, that should maybe create not necessarily need restricted affordable housing but help to nudge the needle towards uh, sort of the missing middle uh, uh, type of housing so that it is more affordable than, than maybe a traditional single family uh, large lot home. Uh, additionally, uh, the commission has been working um, looking at the, the fee schedule for residential and commercial developments. Um, uh, ultimately, it's not planning and zoning commission to tell what the fees are, it's, it's up to town council. So we we looked at council to see if, if you all agree with uh, the proposed modifications to the the fee schedule, but in a nutshell, the idea is to uh, put us more in line with some of our, our peer communities that are around us. Uh, we are considerably more expensive for uh, special permit approval for multi-family development uh, by a, a fairly large order of magnitude. So uh, the idea would be to uh, kind of knock the fee back down to the point that we're still covering the staff time to review potentially large multi-family developments, but, uh, but not so much that, that were uh, very expensive compared to, compared to our neighbors. Um, and then also revisiting the uh, commercial development uh, special permit fees uh, with the idea of uh, bumping up the square footage for uh, sort of each tier of fees with the idea of, of just making it a little bit more uh, business friendly as folks come in. That, that would be a a more minor modification, but one that signals to to the community or to the state at large and the developers that we are, uh, you know, trying to be business friendly. Um, so the other item, and and the, I guess the the biggest one that that uh, the planning and zoning commission has been looking at, and that and that you all as the town council have been looking at, is the uh, uh, implementation of this uh, affordable housing trust fund in combination with uh, uh, affordable housing zoning. So since the last time we met jointly, planning and zoning has taken a, a more detailed look at uh, the affordable housing language that was initially passed. Um, in that review, uh, we decided to bump, or the commission decided to bump the minimum uh, number of units for a new development to have to do something in terms of affordable housing from five up to 10, but the idea of still wanting to encourage the, the smaller scale uh, developers to to come into town without having to uh, necessarily uh, lose a lot of profit on affordable housing. Uh, 
But also what we initially proposed, what the commission initially proposed was a flat $50,000 fee for any unit of affordable housing that, that was not being provided uh, if the minimum 5% affordable wasn't provided. So what we've done is we've tweaked that number to create a sliding scale so that uh, if a developer, we, we hope developers will opt to build affordable housing. That's that's the goal here. But if they were to choose not to, they have the option to pay a fee in, in lieu. And that fee is now variable depending on exactly how many units they're building as opposed to adjusting every 20 units that they, they build. Uh, additionally, in an effort to encourage the construction of affordable housing instead of uh, as a fee in lieu, uh, we tweaked the way the density bonus concept was written in those regs to allow for uh, a density bonus of up to 25% for additional affordable units. So if a developer is already doing 10% affordable and they want to do even more affordable, we would potentially grant a, a bonus in residential density of up to 25% for more affordable units. So uh, the idea being that if somebody wants to go way above and beyond and self uh, both our, our affordable housing numbers up for currently four percent. We'd love to be at uh, at ten percent. Uh, then then that, that will help us to, to get there. So that's kind of where this stands. Uh, the other option or the other item that's on the town council side is uh, if we do this fee in lieu mechanism, we need somewhere to put the money. And and so as I discussed with town council a few weeks ago, we we have a draft ordinance prepared to. Uh, uh, establish an affordable housing trust fund that would allow for those monies to uh, have a place to sit uh, if a developer opts to go that route, and then and then ultimately set up a mechanism for uh, for the town to be able to expend that money in the interest of furthering affordable housing. What we've got proposed is uh, the creation of an affordable housing committee, which would consist of a uh, planning and zoning commission member, a town council member. The town manager, uh, the director of planning and development, and the director of human services uh, to to sit and make recommendations to town council, who would ultimately be responsible for uh, making decisions on, on how those funds get expended. the The idea with that money is that it has to be expended in some way that furthers uh, the development of affordable housing. That could be rehabilitation of uh, some of the stuff in nonprofit owned. That could be uh, uh, rehabilitation of uh, Parker Place or, or something like that. That could be uh, having money to work with future developers down the line to uh, incentivize them to maybe go way above and beyond on affordable housing. So if somebody wants to come in and, and do totally affordable, but the math doesn't quite work, uh, we you could potentially use that money to help, uh, help sway the needle a little bit. But the idea would be that, that it has to support affordable housing in some way. The idea would be that we don't anticipate that this fund would get a lot of deposits. The, the idea here is that people actually build affordable and not, and not buy out. Um, so ideally, this fund would sit potentially for years without having any money put into it or, or taken out of it. Um, or it, it could sit for a while with some money in it as we wait to build up enough money to actually be able to do something with it. Or or we could use it for rehabilitation uh, down the line. But it, it gives us, or it gives the council, I, I suppose maximum flexibility in terms of how they want to and expend those funds within what's what's legally known. So that's what we've got set up, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, David. I'll open the floor to any questions. Hey, Council members, me. Vice Chair Regan, you were helpful. Um, so, David, you mentioned density bonus. Somebody wants to build a lot more affordable housing. How, how does that work? Is that a monetary? Payment that they get, how does it density bonus work? No, so there would be no monetary payment to them necessarily. What what would happen would be if a developer comes in and they say, um, you know, we we're going to build 100 units, and, or we want to build 125 units, and say the um, lot only allows for 100 units under current density, they would have the ability to build up to 90 market rate units, and they could build 10 affordable units under uh, the but just the requirement to build uh, at least 5% and then 10% affordable housing to be eligible for bonus. And then they'd have to build 25 more market rate units. So to take full advantage of the density bonus, for instance, you'd have to build 35 affordable units for the 90 market rate units that you build. Okay. So we would let them have more units in a plot of land beyond what we normally would approve. Now, of course, it has to pass sanitary and, and all those other components you just can't build it if you can't build it you can i mean you can't do that but the idea being is that if you do have a plot of land if it's on 
195 or something like that, where there's access to uh, sewage and water, we would allow additional uh, building out to take place. Okay. Because the, the real the real concern and what we're finding is that the economic benefit or the economic pressures to do these sort of things, you know, we're it, it just doesn't make sense. And builders aren't building because they, you know, they, it's not the goodness of their heart. They want to make money. And if you can't make money, you're not going to do it. So that's why we were looking holistically at all the different components of density, but then also fees, those sort of things. Because we began to realize that we're not competitive. It, with, with the developable land that we have, we've already seen folks going to other places because of the pollen land cost is high. Um, and then you put in the other the other components of fee structures and those sort of things. You know, that's why you're going to build in Coventry or Wellington or something else like that. So we're trying to look at it as, as holistically as we possibly can. Okay. So the density bonus means that uh, normally you'd be able to build X, but now you can build X plus. Right. Right, assuming that that plus was going to be affordable. Right. Okay. Right. And and the goal and, and one of the things that you know we're looking from a flexibility standpoint also is that you may build ninety five or ninety units that are market driven. Those units um, internally could be allowed to be built at a particular cost structure, but perhaps the other ones that are affordable to make them truly affordable. Maybe you're not putting in granite tops and you're not putting in stainless steel appliances. On the outside, they're going to look the same, but on the inside, the we can give the builders some flexibility in terms of reducing the cost to make it affordable. So, you know, we're trying to look at this in a couple of different ways. You know, they're going to be built to code, but you'll have, you know, uh, you, you won't have granite and you won't have these other things. And perhaps maybe it's not top end light switches and stuff like that. So. You know, it's not going to be cheap, cheap, you know, in terms of construction, but it's going to be less expensive. And the other question I just came up with is, um, do you have a feeling as to how developers feel about this fee, whether they're going to other towns? Do they, are they, do you think they'd rather pay the fee or they'd rather build the affordable housing? Or is that something you can't really answer at this point? It, it's going to be depending upon the builder because particular builders have particular marketplaces and particular you know, particular things that they want to do. You know, the conversation with Santini is an example. They do not do affordable housing. They have a business model that is is filling a particular niche in the marketplace. They have you know an occupancy rate of over ninety nine percent. So whatever their business model is, it's very attractive. So therefore, they're not interested. In going into that, there may be other builders that are looking at filling a different niche in the marketplace that may see it as being, you know, uh, being attractive. We were trying to look at this as being innovative and trying to be, you know, looking outside the standard box of how can we attract more people? Because if you look at it historically, over the last 25, 30 years, those folks that lived in Tallinn for a long time know that multifamily was remote. And you don't do that. And that's why we moved to two acre lots. And that's why we had restrictions in regards to multifamily, uh, not having the ability for two family uh, dwellings. There are a whole bunch of limits that were put into place because we didn't want them. It wasn't broadcasted, but it was very obvious. If you look at it, you know, going back, we did not want that. Just like we didn't want particular commercial development in particular areas and those sort of things. But, you know, the, the, the real, it's been an interesting change where the concept of affordable housing 10 years ago or 15 years ago meant section eight or, you know, folks that were, you know, this is going to be a group home or something like that. But the idea now of affordable housing has really become workforce housing. And depending upon, you know, the, the percentages based upon the median income in a particular area, what we're really targeting are, you know, is workforce housing, you know, uh, nurses and teachers and firefighters and folks that aren't earning up to the town median income, but want to live in the town. So we have to look at it as being folks want to live here, but they can't afford a $400,000 two acre four bedroom apartment you know, a house. And then you add on to the change in what people want to live in. There's been a substantial change in the last seven years of what people want to live in. And the, the idea of a single family house 
is not as attractive or it isn't the goal that it used to be. To be exact, there were a lot of people that were looking to say, I don't, you know, if I can't have a condo, I don't want to, I don't want to shovel. I don't want to, you know, do the, do the grass. I don't want to worry about stuff. I want somebody to take care of it for me. So there's been sweeping changes in regards to housing, but at the same time, um, the, the stock that we have in regards to housing is extremely limited. You know, and the idea of even from an affordable housing standpoint, if we can have people come to the town and live in the town and put roots in the town, you may buy a smaller apartment or buy a smaller house. And once you have two or three kids, then guess what? You would be in the market for a single family house potentially with two acres because that's what you want to have now. So we have to attract not just affordable, but young families that are coming in or, or people that want to sell their single family and move into and want to stay in poverty. A lot of folks want to downsize. And with our limited stock, that's why people leave. That was a, a long answer, but it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big complex. I mean, when we really dive into this, you know, especially with the history of affordable housing, and I showed this document before, this was our plan that was developed in 1991, and it kind of got shelved because affordable housing wasn't something we wanted to do. Very good. Thanks. Um, in regards to the fees and trying to reduce those, so I know I think Dave, you said it would cover staff time and staff allotment. I'm curious what, if our fees were that high, what was the additional funding going towards or where did it end up? And I guess what, I don't know if that's a good question for you or for maybe Lisa for finance or? So so what I can say is our, our permitting volume for multifamily is not that high. Right? Okay. So, so yeah, we had a, I mean, we had probably a nice drop of, of funds when the Santini had applied uh, uh, earlier this year that we, where we sort of randomly got $12,000 in revenue that we wouldn't normally have. But I, you know, I would say that's not, it's not a dependable enough revenue yeah. source that you would forecast into the budget okay. regularly. Right? And, and uh, those funds go into the general fund and flow to the fund balance sector. Okay. And then... For, I think I saw the example for, you know, when you were comparing the cost, it was 250 unit residential development. And then for like the fee and meal schedule, like the max was 300 units. Is that kind of the general assumption is that Holland probably would never have them met that? We'd probably like cap out at 250 to 300 units of housing if they were like a big, another CT style development. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. And certainly the way the, the reg is written if somebody were to come in with a larger amount, the, the formula is also written so that that number would, would apply. Uh, but I would be very surprised if we had another 300 plus units. So I know there's still I the village area. I don't uh, think we have the infrastructure yeah. for <laughs> land. Yeah. Where we have the land, I don't think we have the infrastructure to um, handle that. At, at. There, There is property, you know, if you look at the NERAC uh, property, that would have infrastructure. I mean, clearly you'd have to take out that that building, but still it's right there. It's on 185, there's sewer, there's water there. If you look on the other side of 195, you know, right over by USDA, there's property there that's fairly sizable, but you're absolutely right. Once you get off of where the sewer and water is, that 85 acre property that's across by the uh, state police, there's no water up there. So, you know, trying to build out a, a large apartment building that's going to be a challenge, you know, even though its effect on traffic would be minimal out there because you're going to get access to the highway, still you're not going to be able to build it. But I think, you know, the 195 corridor becomes the really more attractive point plus the TVA, yeah. what used to be the TVA. It's TVA GDD or whatever it is. Yeah. It's some seven other back there. <laughs> right. I think that's it for questions right now. I had one other, but it just lost me. So. I was just all open. If there's any other questions generally or any other information, um, I think we've done very well so far. So I guess maybe as a quick summary, what are the next steps? I think Dave for for PZC and then for the ordinance process, you know, just to yep. refresh what the town council will be going through to establish the trust fund. Yep. So so two things that we would bring to PZC or, or to town council and, and kind of one thing that we bring to the PCC. So town council, we would separately bring to you a draft ordinance with a revised fee schedule for, for new planning and zoning fees. And then we would, uh, we can sort of button up this draft ordinance and, and add the appropriate numbers and letters of length to make sure it's, it's appropriate, have the town attorney review and then and, uh, 
and then get it on your agenda would be would be probably our next step. Uh, and then on the PCC side, we would uh, move forward on, on adopting the revised uh, P and Lou uh, density uh, regs. I mean, they have to go to a hearing, and I think initially when we last spoke in July, the the goal was to complete a lot of this by before early mid November. Before you guys get into taxes. Yeah, because I mean, your schedule now becomes collapsed because of taxes. Um, and it, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to do the right thing yeah. and have do make the right decisions. Cause I think we, we kind of, we kind of kickstarted it with, with kind of an artificial horizon thinking it would make us do things. But yeah. once again, if you guys can't do things because of, because of tax season and things like that, it, it doesn't work. And it actually, that whole process gave us the ability to do a reflection on the fee schedules and other regulations and the other components. So in a way, having additional time is going to be able to give us a better structure as we go forward. I mean, just looking at the fee structures when we were putting it on the lower, you know, on the lower, the lower unit sizes, we basically made it impossible because of fifty thousand dollars. If you're putting up a forty, a four bedroom or a four unit apartment, it became impossible. It was unworkable because um, no one's going to spend that money. They're just going to build. So why not? Set the fee structure up in a in an economic equation where you can opt out and use that money, and and also as part of you know the original concept around the the fee you know the the trust fund was just for building, but the more we thought about it, rehabilitation, subsidy subsidy of um, uh, deed deed restricted uh, properties, you know these additional things came up so that that fund could be used for different things besides just the building. So, you know, the more we think about it, the, 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 the better the picture gets because we're able to put more and more details in it. And, and at the end of the day, I think we've also, because we've opened up all these additional avenues, what originally was a truly frightening conversation coming out of Hartford saying, you will do this. And if not, you're gonna see a two mil increase on your taxes we've actually gone from a fear situation to how do we broaden our base of housing in town and make it welcoming? You know, let's, let's make this a, a good conversation rather than I have to do it. You know, go make your bet, you know, that type of yeah. thing versus doesn't your room look better because you made your bet, you know, that's <laughs> what thing. So, and, and quite frankly, <clears throat> we're dealing with decades of, you know, a decade of expectation of what Holland is versus what Holland will become. And folks realizing that it's not, the conversation of affordable housing is not, we have to let others in, but we need others. We need additional folks coming to the town um, who have different, you know, different expectations. And it's the reality of the marketplace now, so. I'll be quiet. I said, no, you're good. And I, I was going to add on to it. I think the life cycle too that you mentioned earlier is beneficial in terms of, you know, a lot of the early denser housing that we've established is senior housing, Parker Place, mm -hmm. Winding River, you know, all these other places generally were catering more towards senior housing because we wanted to allow residents who have been lifers the opportunity to retire in place right. affordably. Right. I think now we're expanding it to a broader base that they can kind of dip their toe in the water of Holland mm -hmm. and then move into a bigger home and then they could cycle the way back in which is exactly exactly the idea i yeah. mean we we kind of started this by looking at the apu the auxiliary dwelling adu the auxiliary dwelling or the the, the, the the tiny houses yeah you know nana's getting old we don't want to put her someplace else we can put her in a tiny house on our property and that was a big a big conversation because gee it's almost a trailer and we don't you know no, it's a tiny house you know here it is um, and now as we look at multifamily, two, two person multifamily, you then get into that opportunity. It could be a brother and a sister, it could be an uncle and somebody else, or it could be, you know, a family that wants to have a revenue opportunity by running out their other house. And it could be uh, done from an affordable standpoint. So we're, we're looking at a number of different ways to achieve the same goal of increasing our housing stock and attracting you know, allowing Holland to attract an even broader scale of people to come here. Because, you know, the, the big scare of the big housing is limited because there's not many jobs here. 
public transportation is limited except for the 913 that goes into Hartford. It's not like we're East Hartford or something like that, where there's a lot of infrastructure there where the fast track, uh, the fast pass goes. But then again, we're right near Hart, we're right, right near Yukon. There is tons of money that's running down 195. And in the last 30 years, we've completely lost that opportunity. What we could have done with 195 from either a commercial standpoint or a housing standpoint could have made a huge difference for us over time. So, are there any other questions? <laughs> Councilor Gunn? Uh, what, what are you hoping uh, in Kenya? What's the position on in Kenya? Well, I think is we're, there, we're, we're the a done deal. Uh, we're awaiting the final the final presentation of the uh, of the yes. So so Santini has completed their planning and zoning approvals. Um, so so the special permit has been approved. They they applied before we started to formally have these conversations. So right. so we're subject to it. Uh, they just got their OSBA approval today, which I'm sure they're very excited about. Um, and, and so their next step now is uh, I mean, you want to explain what OSBA OSBA being uh, the Office of State Traffic. Authority or something like that. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, <laughs> but yeah, the folks that make sure that there are double too many cars on the road. But but so they that got cleared, no problem. So I, I believe they're still waiting on one more thing to be, and then they're good to go to apply for a building permit. Okay. Yeah. All right. <coughs> and as you mentioned, as you mentioned that uh, there's a lot of uh, spaces that we don't have uh, gas or water. So who will who will be interested in uh, building a hundred unit without the, without those sources? It's you know we're it, it, the bigger developments if we look at it is going to be in the 195 corridor. That's really where it's going to be, you know, and and gas being another limiting factor. And we you know, I know that you folks have had the conversation with um, Connecticut Gas, and until there's demand, you know, it's going to be propane. Or it's going to be something else. So, you know, the the expectation of multiple two hundred unit developments is very limited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is which is why we had we changed the fee structure to make it, you know, a little bit more palatable for folks who are going to be building smaller units that would then fit into an infrastructure challenged environment. So, or not. Yeah, we, we're, it'd be great to have gas. I mean, it'd be great to have, you know, that sort of a that sort of an infrastructure. But the uh, we can blame everybody else from 200 years ago for not doing that. Beside uh, beside the boost rain, I mean, I don't think so. We have uh, neither water, neither uh, yeah. sewage, neither uh, gas. We don't have anything. Yeah. So like, uh, what what are we standing on? Basically. And that's also why we're looking at the other regulations in terms of, you know, we're it being able to have two family houses, you know, looking at um, changing the restriction on housing size, um, moving, you know, one of the things I think we'll contemplate in the future will be the, re the removal of the two acre limit on, on housing development. Um, you know, there's that, that seems counterproductive, but at the same time, it also opens up options for smaller houses that could be by fact more affordable you know instead of instead of buying a, a 3,000 square foot house having a 2,000 square foot house or something else and then also working with developers that have uh, subdivisions that have not been completed yet you know working with them in terms of changing some of the, their design properties um, what was the one not uh, it's out by CNC? Oh, yeah, yeah, the Belvedere. Uh, uh, Belvedere, yeah. you know, giving them the option because that was originally going to be built with plus 55 community. And that, you know, that marketplace yeah. just went south. But now we're giving them the ability to have uh, joined uh, buildings, you know, talking to our developers to say, how else can we help you in these areas where you've already made an investment in infrastructure for sewer or for, for lines? Um, you know, those are the things that we're now taking a look at. So it's, you know, we're not hoping for three 500 unit buildings. We're, we're looking at the entire scope that we can provide. Yeah, and I think even going further, uh, what was it, I think a year or so ago, when I think we first got the ARPA funding, there was a lot of discussion about 
what utilities we could possibly reach out right if we tried to get gas to come from mansfield mm -hmm. and right when santini i think we're just starting to talk about following they said no but maybe when santini's established they may take a second look at it or the town could possibly reach out to neighboring communities to see if we can get that pipeline down that way because i think that might then attract more developments even college view is kind of at yeah. stand still unfortunately and i think they were waiting to see what santini was doing but well i, I think once santini is in I don't know if there would be, I mean, there would have to be a, a, a substantial economic reason for them to switch over. Yeah. You know, because although so so Santini is going in on propane with propane. the idea that if they were ever to be a gas line, they can then you can do it. Like the point yeah, which, yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. yeah. So that's you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, that now becomes there's a there's a big fish in the pond. And if we look at other, you know, those other locations. Um, I contend that the Santini development is going to be an economic driver for this community um, that's going to have benefits for us for a long time. Yep. You know, it is, it is, it, I think it's going to transform that side of town and it's going to give opportunities for us that we couldn't, we couldn't contemplate before. Um, so it couldn't happen at a better time and having all these other ideas that are coming forward, you know, is going to allow us to move from the 1950s Holland or the 1970s Holland that we were dealing with, um, to a, uh, to an even more vibrant, uh, community that also still has its heritage, you know, because if we stay away from this part of town, you know, then we still have the green, we still have the historical side. And you know we've 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 highlighted the 195 corridor as being a main area. The 74 corridor would be great, but once again, unless we get a mandate saying we have to run water up to the vineyards because of the you know there, that's not going to change. You know because it could just because of the distances. But see what a see what a drive through can do. To make <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Think, Chair, oh go ahead. Go ahead I think it's a. Uh... I think it's Centennial is a, to me, I think Centennial is a plus. And I think we're really smart move for on their behalf and obviously the town, 200 units, I mean, 400 people. I mean, so obviously it's going to be a new businesses in might be, and it, as you as you guys open the job too, I'm not saying that could be a good day McDonald's. I mean, you know, trying to bring it out more businesses. I think that's a that's a job. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll keep going. No, I, I've, I mean, we we've been talk uh, we've been talking in the past, but when I draft two issues, everything else, but I, I'm in a favor. Yeah. Well, I think that you know the Duncan experience was was a great test for us to be able to go through you know there was there it was almost a perfect scenario to figure it out and i think i i haven't heard anybody say anything anything bad you know the the dire expectations of traffic being an issue the the dire expectations of of trash and everything else i you literally pass Duncan about 5 30, 5 25 every morning. Mm -hmm. And I used to be, I mean, last seven years, uh, last few years I've been doing it. Before, before the drive through, there's a hardly a one car, two car. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say at least there's about three or four cars at that moment mm -hmm. on, the, on the job, on the circle. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's an improvement. And I say, as it is, I mean, it's, a, it's been there, and this job, Duncan and McDonald, they won job too. Right. So I think that was a, one of the greatest moments on your part. Yep. It's, so, it, it, occasionally you have to take risks, and I think we did it in a very, you know, in a very staged approach. Um, we have other challenges in, in the TVA that we're still dealing with, but what's interesting is that we're beginning to get people coming to his office. Saying I have a concept, and actually we've changed our out uh, our outreach and our engagement with developers. Saying come and talk to us about a concept. That's what the POZ uh, the POZ was all about. Saying give us a concept. You know we're not gonna you know we're not gonna make you go through a three hundred thousand dollar complete engineering design review 
spend ten thousand to do some you know some schematics and talk to us about it, you know, and, and say, yeah, this is something that we can look at. And the other side of it, I mean, the the the, the one of the hidden gems of the uh, the Tallinn government structure is our um, architectural design review board. I mean, those folks are fantastic to work with in many cases. And you know they have a lot of a lot of knowledge that they can bring to the table. Now, it's going to be interesting in the next two to three years as Tampini is built up to see how is this really going to play. But I don't I don't see a lot of downside. I really don't. I mean that the there may be some more traffic coming off the highway there. There may be some more traffic, but once again with the 195 expansion having been done, it's not as bad as it would have been seven years ago when people were waiting to get off the highway over the Yukon game. So by widening that out, we've got a lot of a lot of additional capability there. But I what we wanted to, you know, what we wanted to continue to communicate is that the the planning and zoning uh, in Holland is not stuck in the pre 2000s you know in terms of what we were looking to build we're, we're we're really taking a look at the trends we're really taking a look at you know the the the, the interest that's coming through um to be able to make this even more vibrant while at the same time maintaining the character of the town because that once again is a driver you know it's we're never going to have the the jobs here you know, we don't have the infrastructure to be able to have factories or office buildings. And quite frankly, no one's building office buildings anymore because everybody's staying home. And if everybody's staying home, then you need to have more smaller services locally. So this stay at home thing actually will drive more smaller businesses in the area. And we're working now to ensure that um, uh, home-based businesses are actually able to advertise a little bit more. They're actually able to get out and put a sign on their driveway saying, here's my painting business or here's my manicure or whatever it is, you know, come and be here. So we're, we're really trying to look at a different economic reality from a, from, a, from a commercial standpoint. And at the same time, presenting a willingness to change in regards to our housing as well. So I'm done. I, I get on my soapbox. <laughs> Brian, you think you want to add? That's impressive. Uh, so we um, had a confidence meeting, I'll call it, with Santini this week as I was new to town. Um, and we wanted to get a feel and then pick their brain on advice on where we could be. As I've mentioned before, prior to coming here, um, the reputation of Holland, uh, undeservingly for the last uh, decade or so, but uh, historically was uh, negative to business owners and developers confirmed to me uh, by a business owner in Mansfield um, over the summer. Um, just matter of fact, we told me, by the way, the reputation, if you're taking that job, the reputation of Holland is they're not friendly to business owners and developers. Um, and confirmed to us um, with our meeting with Santini that that was our reputation. Uh, and and um, to pick his, his brain um, as to where they are and what can we do uh, better. And um, trying to work out some, some iron outs, some hiccups with the smoothness of the design uh, board is, is one of those things. Uh, afterwards, there was a, a phone call to me from um, one of them. I went to high school in Fulton um, about, again, the fees that you guys are looking to uh, improve here. He said that was the most unattractive thing and that you know we want him to tell his developer friends and speak highly of the process he went through here in town, reputation of everything. Um, so uh, it, was, it was positive. Um, and, and again, we got a good feel as to where they were. And, and you know, what's great is father and both, both of the kids are rooted here in town. Yeah. One of them lives out of town. Uh, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do anything uh, in my estimation negative. I couldn't, it was a good confidence meeting on both sides, them to have confidence in the town. And we imparted that to them that we really want your, your uh, initiative here to be successful. And we're gonna work with you to that. And. Um, the same on the other end. So that, that's great that we were able to build confidence too. That's all. That's great. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions before we uh, open it up to anyone in the public that would like to speak? All right, seeing now we'll move to item three, so public comment on the subject of possible creation of affordable housing trust with a three minute limit. I know I think most people that are other commissioners or members of other boards. So, all right. Going once, going twice. I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn at 7:52 p.m.
I'll make that motion. Is there a second? A second. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. It's unanimous. We are adjourned.